Hey friends, this is Michael Brown. As you're listening to this broadcast right now, I am at my mother's funeral service in New Jersey. So I've pre-recorded this show. I recorded it yesterday before flying over to New Jersey for the funeral service. And I just felt it was appropriate to take this time to, to honor my mother, to honor my father as well, but to encourage you with some spiritual truths, to encourage you with some thoughts about life, about living, about family, about honor. So not only do I hope to honor my mom and my dad in saying what I say today, but I hope also to encourage you to make every day count. Listen, friends, there, there's no such thing as a wasted life if that life is given over to God. And there's, there's no such thing as a wasted life if that life touches other people. And really, every life touches people. And I, I want to encourage you to, to make the most of the time that you have here on this earth. My mom lived a, a good long life. She, she passed away a Friday morning at the age of 94, just went into cardiac arrest and was gone. She was frail. She was in long-term care at that point. Uh, she'd been in an apartment for the elderly about 10 minutes from us uh, for the months before that, but then her health started to degenerate. She was in the emergency room a few times and then in the hospital. So when she came out, she ended up in a place for long-term care, uh, basically stayed in bed. But, but still, her, her mind was sharp. She was on no medication. She wasn't suffering. And she went home quickly. That was our desire. We didn't want her to suffer or be in any kind of pain. 94 years, that's a long time. But, but looking at the pictures, looking at family pictures, she, she had uh, one little suitcase with a, a lot of uh, pictures and things in it. So I was going through those and getting stuff ready to give to, to my sister. There are just two of us, my sister and I. And looking through them, looking through at pictures of my mom, before I knew her when she was just uh, newly married to my dad and and looking at pictures of me as a little child with my sister as little children and then all the pictures she had of, of our kids uh, growing up. So now they're in their late 30s, our daughters, but the pictures of them growing up and, and even a picture of my wife and our wedding, of course, seen those pictures so many times, but just was reminded, uh, Nancy just turned 21. I was two days shy of 21. And we were, we were just like children. We we're, were only a few years older then than our oldest granddaughter, who turned 16 in January. And uh, you realize how quickly life passes. Yeah, it takes a long time, and some of you have had a hard life, and it feels even longer. But it's gone in a moment of time. All the more reason then, as, as Ecclesiastes urges us to remember our Creator in the days of our youth, all, all the more urgent is it that, that we live lives that, that make sense in the light of eternity. So before I share some things about my mom, my upbringing, I, I trust you'll be blessed as you hear these things. Can I encourage you to show love to a family member today? Can I encourage you that, I don't want to be morbid, but if this was your last day with them, you'd want them to know how much you love them. You want them to know how meaningful and special they were. They should know that on some level all the time. They should feel that all the time. So even if somehow you didn't see each other for some days, you would know, or some weeks or some months that there was separation for some reason, they would know the depth of your love. And can I encourage you, if you're not right with a relative, with a family member, with a loved one, uh, reach out to them. And if, and, and if there's something wrong on your end, then humble yourself and ask forgiveness and get things right. Live in such a way that makes sense in the light of eternity. Live in a way that makes sense in the light of the fact that there's just one family that we have. Let's love each other. Let our love be known. Thanks so much for joining us today on The Line of Fire. This is Michael Brown. Today's show is pre-recorded because right now I am at my mother's funeral in New Jersey. So thanks for your prayers. Thanks for your prayers for, for my sister and her husband, and their son and for the rest of my family uh, during this time. Really do appreciate it. So there is a, a rabbi doing the service at the request of my, my sister and her son. 
which of course I was perfectly fine with. And uh, the rabbi wanted to chat with us briefly because he wants to say a few words uh, about about my mom and then perform the the uh, the ceremony there at the grave site. And it turns out he's a regular listener to the Line of Fire broadcast. Isn't that something? If he misses the show on WMCA, he then uh, gets the podcast and listens later. So, Rabbi, obviously you're not listening today, but perhaps you'll listen to the show afterwards. And uh, thank you for being there at the funeral and, f- and for your care uh, for the dying and for the families of the deceased uh, as, as a hospice rabbi. Uh, my mom was born in England, in Leeds, England, in 1922, September 25th, 1922. And her mom died when she was just a child, and her father abandoned the family. God only knows the circumstances and what was going on in his mind, but, but he abandoned the, the family when my mom was, was just a child, having lost her mother. So she was sent over to the States to be raised by another couple, some older relatives. What's interesting, though, is growing up like that, you know, you think of all of the terrible dysfunction. You think of the upheaval and the abandonment. She was a very stable woman. I I never heard her complain about her father, just just that that's what happened. And... uh, you know, you think of all the emotional scarring and everything else, and she she grew up as as a very as a very strong woman, and is loving and caring and affirming and giving a mother as as you can imagine. And when I think back, you know, if the, to to all the things that she would would give as as a mother, and and all the things that mothers do, that's just what strikes me over and over that she gave herself to her kids, that she gave herself to, to loving, that she was absolutely unselfish. That even when, when she was 94 and you know, when she was sick and, and was in the hospital and was afraid because she didn't know what was the matter, and uh, Nancy was there with her and our, our daughter Megan that lives right near us, they were there together. And then as soon as I could get over there, I, I was there and and... She just didn't want to be left alone, so I, I spent the night just sleeping in the chair next to the next to the hospital bed. And she was apologetic to us. I'm sorry. She didn't want to be a burden. She never wanted to be a burden. She never she'd never complain. She she wouldn't want you to know that she was going through a hard time because she just she just wanted us to be happy and not to be concerned. And the level of affirmation that I got from my mom is extraordinary. You know, there's a joke about Jesus being Jewish. How do we know that Jesus was Jewish? Again, it's an internal Jewish joke, and it has it has meaning, and it does convey something. And the four ways we know that Jesus was Jewish. One, he went into his father's business. Two, he was unmarried at 30. Three, he thought his mother was a virgin. Four, his mother thought that he was God. You say, well, that's, that's funny. Yeah, the proud Jewish mother. So listen, when I was a heavy drug user, my parents were very concerned, uh, didn't know what to do about me, and I can't imagine what I, what I put them through. I tried to convince them I'd change certain drugs I was doing, and they didn't seem to be that concerned. I told them I wasn't shooting heroin anymore and, and lied and all of this, and and, you know, they wanted to hope the best and think the best. But when I got radically born again, they were thrilled to see me off drugs. But now my dad said, OK, you need to talk to the local rabbi and so on. So that's what got me on my whole journey of interacting with rabbis in the Jewish community and learning Hebrew and, and so on. Well, I, I come home from school one day. I come home from high school. And at this point, I'm about about 18 years old. And I've been in the Word day and night. I, I used to spend at least six hours alone with the Lord every day. I'd, I'd pray at least two hours, excuse me, at least three hours. I'd read the Word at least two hours. I would memorize Scripture for an hour. So that, that would be uh, 20 verses a day. God helped me to memorize every day without fail. And then I'd share the Gospel with at least one new person every single day. And this was my habit for years. Uh, excuse me, for, for months, for 
uh, for, for six months, day and night when I was in high school. This was my habit. So I, I come home from high school one day, and there's a woman leaving the house as I'm pulling up into the driveway. She's a Jehovah's Witness, lives down the block from me, also a Jewish woman as well. So we begin talking, and immediately when I find out she's a Jehovah's Witness, you know, I want to talk to her. She wants to talk to me. So we start going back and forth, and I could see when she would raise one of her points and I would answer with the scripture, because in those days I was like machine gun with scripture. I didn't have all the compassion and wisdom, but having memorized all those thousands of verses, boom, I was, I was there. And, and I could see as I made the point that she was listening, because I noticed others that I, I spoke to Jehovah's Witnesses that I made the point, but they weren't even listening. They didn't hear it. It didn't register. They just went to their next argument. I could see she got a little jarred. I could see she was listening. So, we, we kept talking, and over a period of time, she renounced the teachings of Kingdom Hall and, and left Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, I asked her, once we got to know each other well, I asked her, so what happened with my mom? When you were talking to my mom, what did she say to you? And she said, oh, your mother said to me, remember, this is my, my Jewish mom. My mother, she said, your mother said to me, uh, I'm not very religious. I'm not really interested in religion, but wait for my son to come home and talk to him. He'll convert you. He converts everybody. That, that was my proud Jewish mom. When I used to debate rabbis, and sometimes there'd be a, a, a debate on the radio or something like that. Of course, I still debate them, but back in those days, there might have been something on the radio uh, she and her Jewish friends that she played Mahjong with this tile game or Canasta, <clears throat> other games they would play in the afternoons, uh, they would sit around and listen and root for Rose's son. <laughs> Even though I was the one with the different beliefs, they would root for Rose's son. And that's something I saw about my mom and my dad, that their their love for me was greater than any of the things that, that caused us to have differences and that was my mom, always affirming. And I, I want to encourage you moms and dads. Of course, you want to correct your kids. Of course, you want to speak the truth to your kids. <clears throat> of course, there's a place for healthy discipline, obviously. But your kids need to be affirmed. Your kids need to know that they are loved. Your kids need to know and that was with my mom and my dad, the deep affirmation they had. My my dad used to tell his friends where he worked at the New York Supreme Court as the senior law assistant there, so working directly uh, for the judges. In fact, he almost became a Supreme Court justice uh, in, in New York uh, before, he, before he passed away at the age of 63 in 1977. But he used to jokingly refer to me as, as my son, the priest. And my parents would come and hear me preach because they were proud of their son. And w- when I would play at a concert when I was a boy. I played percussion and, and band and orchestra in junior high and high in high school. And so you have a concert. So they were there. I had a concert. They were always there. Most of the parents would try to come. They were always there. And, you know, I'm, I'm standing in the back of the orchestra because, uh, you know, percussion is normally in the back there, back and on the side. Some, and, so I'm looking out, I could see, you know, everybody in front of me in the orchestra and all the, of course, everybody in the audience, we could all see. And, and the parents would come in and they'd sit down. I, I'd look through, I'm just standing there watching. All the parents would come in and sit down and my, my mom and dad would come in and my dad would always wave at me. I, and I knew I had to wave back. I remember thinking, dad, none of the other parents wave, but th- that's, that's just the way they were. There was something about them. In, in, in the way of affirmation, there was something about them in, in the way of, of you know, I, I had one sister, but I was always the number one son. That's how we joked about it. So I, I just want to encourage you, as this is the day of my mom's funeral, if you're just tuning in. So I, I recorded the show yesterday on Monday for today, Tuesday. I, I want to encourage you to be affirming as parents. I want to encourage you to be affirming as grandparents. I, I want to encourage you to let your kids know that they count, that their lives are special. Uh, it, I am sure that that helped put a deep confidence in me 
when it turned into my relationship with God, I'm sure that that has played into it, the love and affirmation from a loving mom and dad, as I honor my parents, specifically my mom today. Thanks so much for being part of the broadcast today. This is Michael Brown. As you're listening to this show, I'm at my mother's funeral in New Jersey, and I recorded this show yesterday, Monday, to especially honor my mom and my dad as well at this uh, day of funeral service. God willing, we'll be back with you live on the air tomorrow, the day before Thanksgiving. Uh, And thanks for your prayers. Thanks for the many, many, many expressions of love that we've received. You know, my dad died suddenly in 1977 at the age of 63. My wife Nancy and I had just seen him and my mom earlier in the evening. Uh, You know, he seemed to be in, in perfectly good health at that time. Uh, our younger daughter, Jennifer, was just born a few months earlier, and, and it was the thrill of his life to finally be a grandfather. So to get the call in the middle of the night that he was gone is is so utterly shocking and so utterly jarring, and, and you know, the, the pain of that it was so, so, so intense and unreal. It's different. It's different when you are with a parent now for decades here I'm, I'm 61 now. My dad died at 63. My mom just passing at 94. And and towards the end, you you think, okay, the biggest thing is we just don't want her to suffer. You don't want her to be in pain. And especially if we have you have a confidence of your loved one being with the Lord, then you're just you you want to be there for them. You want to bring a smile to their face. You want to bring joy to their heart. And, and when it's time for them to go, of course, it's painful, but it's something that, that's so very different. There's something about living out life to the full. And, and, and I want to encourage you again, as I've been saying, kind of like a broken record, live your life the way that, that makes sense in the light of eternity. Pour into your family, pour into your kids, pour into your loved ones, reach out to others Spend quality time with God, and, and you'll look back. Sure, there's the nostalgia and the pain, looking back at the past and all the memories and the, the world you can't go back to and, and how quickly time passes. But then you also think, wow, there's a legacy. There's a legacy. And, and my mom's great legacy was her kids and her grandkids. And, and that's, that's what really mattered. And now her great-grandkids as well. I want to tell you a story about my mom. She uh, she was not a great cook. Um, <clears throat> I mean, growing up seemed fine to me, but uh, she was not a great cook, and and we didn't have a lot of conception about nutritious eating in like the fifties and sixties. So when I was a boy, breakfast was kind of on my own. So I had four Oreo cookies for breakfast in the morning. And then I'd come home for lunch. It was about a half mile from the school, but we'd all, we'd all walk home. Just a more innocent environment in those days. Uh, we just uh, all, all walk home from elementary school. So, you know, six, seven, eight years old, you know, kids, we, we'd walk home from school and then have lunch. And my lunch for six straight years every day was a peanut butter sandwich, not peanut butter and jelly, peanut butter sandwich with the crust removed because I didn't like the crust and grape juice. And then I come home from school a few hours later and normally have pretzels and grape juice as my snack. And then for dinner, we'd have one of a few different, uh, a few different menu items. Uh, my mother and I were really picky. My father and sister ate just about everything. So there'd be spaghetti and meatballs one day. There might be a burger another day, a burger and fries. There'd be maybe a tuna noodles one day, maybe some kind of chicken thing another day, and it'd vary, you know, through the week. And the the spaghetti and meatball, oh, and sometimes, I virtually never had fruit. Sometimes I'd have like a little cucumber or a little green pepper before dinner, but then I'd, I'd heavily salt that. I like the way it tasted salted. Yeah, so you're talking about unhealthy eating my whole life. And uh, when my mom would make spaghetti and meatballs, <laughs> she, she, she used to use tomato soup for the sauce. All, all my Italian friends are groaning now. She used to use Italian soup for the sauce. And uh, when I started preaching, 
and 18, 19 years old, started traveling out a little bit in the tri-state area from New York. Uh, I, I stayed at, at an Italian family's home. They had a pastor, uh, had a little church there, maybe 30-something people, almost all Italian. So I stayed at his home. And Sunday after the service, of course, you're going to have a meal. And if you're a good Italian family, you don't go to a restaurant. You eat at home. That's, that's how you treat special guests. So <laughs> they cooked me spaghetti and meatballs. Now, this must have been amazingly good, but I almost choked on it because I was used to the version with, uh, with spaghetti uh, uh, tomato soup for the sauce. <laughs> of course, I learned to love the real thing. But during the years of the Brownsville Revival, the local newspaper gave glowing reports on the revival for a couple of years. I, I think over 40 articles they had on the revival, and almost all of them overwhelmingly positive. Of course, it had, had a great impact on the city and the region in many ways. So at some point, they turned on us, and, and they wrote this really horrific uh, series of articles attacking two of the main leaders, and then I knew they were coming after me and the other main leader after that. And they, they would call, uh, say, the, the evangelist, they'd call his mother to try to find a contradiction in her story compared to his, that he wasn't arrested as much as he said he was before he was saved or whatever. And Nancy kept telling me, call your mom, call your mom. The guy's going to call your mother. I said, he's not going to call my mother. She said, no, you need to call her. So I kept forgetting. I finally called her, I think it was on Mother's Day, and I said, hey, mom, uh, you may get a call from this guy from this uh, Pensacola News Journal. I gave her the name. And uh, she said, oh, he called. We had a very nice talk. I said, you did? She said, yeah, we had a very nice talk. I said, well, what did you tell him? She told him, I told him you're always a very bright boy and, and, and you had some problem in your teenager, but then you worked your way through grad school and I was so proud of you. And I said, did he say anything else about drug use? She said, oh, yeah. He said, were you shooting heroin? Because he was trying to prove that I... I, my story was not true, that I exaggerated my story about, uh, uh, you know, my drug years before I was saved. And she said, oh, no, he was shooting heroin, and we were very, very concerned. She said, but then, as my Jewish mom, she said, then he converted to Christ, and he was changed overnight. <laughs> so when the newspaper report came, he, had, he did not quote a single word from my mother because he couldn't get anything out of her that was anything but a proud, affirming, loving mother. Uh, that's, that's, that's love. That's, that's what moms can do in a way that is so extraordinary as moms have that unique ability to give themselves for the well-being of their kids. So I, I honor my mom this day as we bury her. I honor my mom this day on this pre-recorded broadcast. And you say, well, is, is there, we said flowers to do anything. How, how about being moms and dads to your kids. How about honoring your father and your mother? Maybe you haven't reached out to them. Maybe they're lonely. Is, is that God's best for them? Is that your best for them? Don't live in such a way that at a funeral you have massive regret. Live in such a way that at a funeral you may deeply miss your loved one, but say, they knew I loved them and I was there for them. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Let's make our lives count, friends. Welcome, welcome to the Line of Fire. This is a special day, a tribute to my mom and to my dad as well. I recorded this show on Monday because right now, as you're listening on Tuesday, November 22nd, I'm at the gravesite funeral for my mom in New Jersey. Uh, thanks for your prayers. Uh, it's it's a sober time. It's a special time. When you lose a loved one and they've lived a long life and they're confined to bed at the end and you, uh, you know that their time is limited, you don't want them to suffer. You just want to be there, bring a smile to their face and, and be assured that, that they'll be welcomed into God's hands in the world to come. So it's a different kind of loss than someone dying suddenly in a, in a car wreck or, or a young person being cut down, but it's still a loss, you know, and, and, and all the memories and thinking through life and makes you think about life today. It makes you think about life going forward. And you, you know what also happens at a funeral? 
you realize what really matters, don't you? That's why Ecclesiastes says it's better to be in the house of mourning than the house of feasting. Now, there, there's a bit of a pessimism in that note in the midst of Ecclesiastes. As Ecclesiastes is kind of like the author of the book is, is taking you on a journey from here to here to here and, and stopping and thinking and, and, and giving perspective along the way. So you kind of go with him on the journey till you get to the end of, of the book and its affirmation of the importance of serving God and keeping his commandments. But, you, you know, you're at a funeral and maybe you see someone that you've been estranged from and you say, listen, let's, let's, let's get together this week. Let, let's sit down together. There's no reason for us to be estranged. You realize what really matters. Maybe some disagreement with a relative and you're upset about this, you're upset about that. And you think, okay, there's no reason for that. There's no reason for that. So I'm the one at, at the funeral today. I'm the one thinking about these things, but I, w- I want to take that perspective and share it with you and, and, and say, live with that kind of seriousness. Oh, I don't mean that you don't have fun over Thanksgiving and do silly stuff with your family if that's what you do. No, no. What I, what I mean is don't let the little things stand in the way of what really matters. Don't, don't let some old difference that you had with a friend separate you from someone you were once close with. Don't don't let some dispute with a loved one get in the way of what really matters. And and I, I want to repeat this once again. Don't live in such a way today that at a funeral service you'll be there filled with regret. I never told them I loved them. They didn't know I was there for them. I, I we had misunderstandings and they got in the way. I neglected them. You know, you don't want to live with that guilt, and then you could you can never ever get under the weight out from under the weight of it because the person is gone. It can be so tormenting. Of course, God can comfort and forgive, and and if you've fallen short in a relationship, He can now redeem that for other relationships. But you know, when my dad died suddenly in October of 1977, He knew how much I loved Him, and I knew how much He loved me. I mean, that was deep, deep, deep between us. But I keep having dreams after he died that he was alive and that I was just getting to tell him one last time how much I loved him. And, you know, I last saw my mom alive Wednesday morning. She she passed from this world Friday morning. And we had to sign some documents. Uh, just I was officially getting power of attorney f- for a couple things and signing living will just had to take care of these things and not knowing she was about to go. But she had to sign all these things and it was hard. She had fractured her wrist a while ago and she wasn't 100% with it. And I remember I just took that frail, frail hand and wrist and just, just kissed it. And uh, I'm so glad, I'm so glad I got to do that before she left this world. Welcome friends to the Line of Fire broadcast. I'm not taking any calls today. I recorded this show yesterday, Monday, because today, right at this very hour, is the day for my mom's funeral, my dear, precious mom, the day for her funeral, and uh, I'm, I'm there probably right at this very moment as you're listening at the grave site or, or just about ready to leave from there with our younger daughter, Megan, and then my sister, Melissa, and her son, Adam, and some other friends and relatives that were there just for this intimate uh, gravesite service. But thanks for your prayers. Thanks for the, the many uh, kind words that you've, you've sent in. And interestingly enough, the rabbi uh, performing the ceremony today is a regular listener to the Line of Fire on our New York station, New York, New Jersey station, WMCA. So we had a, a very, very warm talk. Uh, if you didn't read the tribute that I wrote to my mom, I think you'd be blessed by it. Uh, just go to uh, askdrbrown.org and you will see it there. Uh, let me let me share a story as I'm honoring my mother and and my father as well. Let me share a story about my dad that that helped shape my life in 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 God. And again, the way that we treat our kids as parents will also affect how they relate to God. We can make it easier. We can make it harder. 
And, you know, many times when, when a, a, a child does not have an image of a loving father or affirming mother, when a child grows up in a harsh, negative, you're always falling short, there's always something wrong with you, when they grow up in an environment like that, many times it's, it's hard for them to relate to the love of the Father. They, they almost transfer their wrong views about an earthly father to their heavenly father. Of course, it can all be fixed, but many times it's, it's easier when you have a loving, affirming parent or parents to now know how loving and affirming our God is while also being a God of, of, of goodness and discipline and justice. So at the age of 14, I started smoking pot and then quickly got to heavier drugs. And when my parents found out what I was doing, when they found out I was shooting heroin, they were terribly concerned, uh, understandably. And I was a real rebel. I mean, I was, I was bad, bad, bad in those days. And I remember spending time with my mom a few years back when she still lived on Long Island, when she was still living by herself. And, and we were just laying down on her bed talking. And, and she just said, you know, we didn't know what to do. We just didn't know what to do. And you think, oh, gosh, the pain that I put them through. And my dad would pray a prayer in, 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 by my door uh, every night and just... Uh, a lot of pain that, that I put them through in those days. And to my shame, the, the ugliest thing that I did was, um, was I would uh, a few times steal money from my own father. I found out he had this money put aside, and I'd steal a thing out. He won't notice it. And it wasn't even for me. It was I help a friend out, you know, whatever, some drug issue with a friend. And it's it's so shameful for me to say these things, but I I, I have to say it because I've I, I've got to honor my dad, and I can only honor him by telling you the story. So, uh, I ended up doing stealing the money one other time, and and he uh, he knew I did it, but I I blamed my friends. I said, well, I I didn't do it. It was some other uh, some other guys that did it you know and and I made it look like someone broke into the house through the back door and I cut a screen and and said they did it and anyway to punish me this is right before I got saved to punish me he said well then none of your friends can come over to the house and I knew he knew I did it but he was rightfully punishing me for okay if you're going to lie then here's the punishment coming your way and not long after that, by God's grace and mercy, I got I got born again, I got wonderfully born again. And some days went by, and my dad now knew I was completely off drugs, and he saw that I was a changed person. So we're sitting down one night together at the kitchen table in our house, and he said, Michael, uh, did you steal that money? Oh, gosh, it was like an arrow. And I, I mean... I, how how could I tell my dad that I did it? How how could I tell him I was guilty? So I I lied, and I said no, Dad, I I didn't. He goes, okay, I was just asking, but I couldn't sit there. I was under such intense conviction. I couldn't sit there. So I I went upstairs. I said, Dad, I, I'm gonna go go to bed, uh, go to my bedroom. I went upstairs. And I was smitten with conviction. I got on my knees. Oh, it was like this divine arrow piercing deep in my heart. And I said, oh, God, I'm so sorry. I'll, I'll tell him. I'll tell my dad I am so sorry. And then the conviction left. I thought, oh, maybe just confessing to God was enough. Maybe I didn't need to tell my dad. No, oh, that arrow of conviction came back. I said, okay, okay, I'll go tell him. So I went back downstairs. My dad was still sitting there at the kitchen table. And I said, Dad, uh, I, I stole the money. I have to tell you, I stole the money. Now, here's what my dad said. This is my Jewish dad. Here's, here's what my dad said. Are you ready? He said this. He said, the moment I saw the money missing, I knew that you took it. And I forgave you on the spot. He said, what hurt me was that you had a need and you didn't come and talk to me about it. Oh, gosh. Can you, can you imagine that's my earthly father telling me that? 
Can you imagine what that does when you were raised like that with that much love from your parents and that much forgiveness from your parents and that much pride and joy that your parents have in you? Do you know the, the confidence that instills in you before God and the meaning of that, how extraordinary it is? And my dad said, you know, it it wasn't really fair for me to ask you because I know you have to tell the truth now. I I mean, that's that's what I grew up with. And as you know, as as I've mentioned, you know, when when I would debate a rabbi and my my mom and her her friends, all Jewish, would listen. My mom rose. They would root for Rose's son, even though they're all Jewish. And I was debating a rabbi. They would root for Rose's son. That was the level of of pride and affirmation. So here, here's my mom, and she's now uh, elderly. She, we had her live with us for about a year, and then she just needed a bit more help than we were able to give her, and it was hard with my travel schedule. So we got her into this uh, apartment building for the elderly, uh, near near our house, about 10 minutes away. So we'd go see her all the time and play cards with her, things like that. She was always sharp when, when she fractured a wrist and, uh, and had to have therapy, physical therapy. The therapist would come in and uh, she would insist they played cards too and she'd always, she'd always beat them. She could do New York Times uh, crossword puzzles. Uh, you know, her mind was still sharp. Her short-term memory wasn't so good, but long-term she was, she was still sharp. And uh, I'd, I'd come into the room and one of the health care givers would be there or a therapist. They'd be walking out and they said, oh, are you Dr. Brown? They'd never heard of me before. They didn't know who I was <laughs> but because my mom would speak in such glowing terms. Oh, you're Dr. Brown. Oh, we've got I've, I can't wait to listen to your radio show. Still a proud mom. So, look. It's not a matter of overlooking our kids' faults. It's not a matter of of being dishonest with them about who they are. It's a matter of doing what only a mom and dad can do and giving them that deep affirmation of love that on their worst day, they're still loved by you, that on their worst day, they're still special to you, that on their worst day, you'd still give yourself for their well-being that's what moms and dads do. And, and there's a way to correct that's correcting in love. There's a way to correct that's filled with affirmation. But that affirmation that can only come from a mom and dad. It doesn't matter who else you get it from as you're a child. The mom and dad play that key role. And, and I am eternally indebted to my mom and dad for the love, for the affirmation, for the kindness for the gentleness, for, for, in that sense, making their worlds revolve around our well-being. And I, I remember my dad saying, hey, we, Nancy and I were praying. We didn't have money for groceries and stuff. And, and when you're newly married, and I was in college still, and, and you know, my dad had put some money aside so we'd have some money when we first got married. And I remember talking to him one day and saying, you know, yeah, dad, we had this need. And he's handing me money. He said, you know, I'm Jesus floor agent here. <laughs> you pray. And I'm the one through whom the answer comes. Uh, what a delight. What a delight. All right. I've got some more to share. We'll be right back. You know, one reason why it's easy for me to believe God that anything is possible, that he could do anything through me that that he desires to do and that in a sense nothing would surprise me well I'm sure he could surprise but you know what I'm saying because I I'm not trusting me I'm trusting God I believe one reason for that is is the affirmation I received from my mom and my dad as I take time to to honor my mom today on this day of her funeral I pre-recorded this show yesterday Monday November 21st and God willing tomorrow day before Thanksgiving we'll be back with you live here on the line of fire. But in keeping with the biblical injunction to honor your father and mother, I, I'm joyfully doing this today, and I felt it would be appropriate to have this tribute broadcast to her. Uh, and, and since my dad died in 77, 
decades before I was on the radio or, or knew so many of you. I want to take this time, and I've done it on the show, to honor my dad as well. But he, here's a perfect illustration, a perfect illustration of, of the way my mom was, the way she was towards me. And as, as my wife Nancy always said, you know, I could do no wrong in her eyes. And, and we would laugh about it. You know, she was, as Nancy said, the ideal mother-in-law. And just a few months back when she was in the hospital and Nancy was spending time with her and said, you were the, the perfect mother-in-law, she said, yeah, I was not intrusive. And, and she, she never was. She never was. She had different opinions on things. She never intruded on, on our relationship. So here she is now old, not in a nursing home at that point, but in a, a, a home or apartment building or for, for the elderly. And uh, uh, I, I was going to visit her one day and, you know, I'd see her a few times a week. We'd play cards or I'd just make sure, okay, she, she's got the stuff. She, she liked gummy bears and she liked uh, crystallized ginger coated with sugar and she liked raisins, chocolates, also some Lynn's truffles, and then she liked chocolate chip cookies. So yeah, that's where I got my sweet tooth from. Thankfully, I uh, my sweet tooth is now expressed in desire for fruits and things like that. But uh, she was always real thin, and she didn't eat a lot of that, but that's, she liked that. So I'd have to go and buy that stuff for her and bring it over. So one day, I'm, I'm going over to the place where, where she lives, this, this home for the, the elderly. And uh, I have to change plans because I was asked to, to be on Piers Morgan TV show that night as part of a panel talking about Duck Dynasty and, and, and uh, gay issues and things like that. So I call her and I said, hey, mom, listen, I can't come over today. I'll come over tomorrow instead. Uh, I said, do you know who Piers Morgan is on CNN? She goes, oh, you're going to be on his TV show? Now, picture, just just think for a minute, all right? Your average person, if you say, oh, do you know so-and-so on TV? Do you know Bill O'Reilly on TV or Anderson Cooper on TV? Their their initial response is not going to be, oh, you're going to be on their TV show? But that, that was my mom because she just thought the world of me. And when, when folks would come in to take care of her there, uh, a nurse that would come in once a day or, or they'd bring her meals or they just, they'd just help with this or that, you know, whatever she needed. These folks would, would be so honored to meet me because my mother had told them how famous I was in, in her eyes. That was just the way it was. I, I'm almost sure I could tell her. Oh, yeah, uh, Mom, listen, I can't come over today. Uh, the President Obama wants to meet with me. Oh, really? What's that about? It wouldn't be like the president or, yeah, President Trump, President-elect Trump wants to see me. Oh, good. <laughs> that's, just, that's just what she thought. Uh, so utterly precious. And the, uh, the caregivers used to get a kick out of her because uh, she's real, real little and frail, just, like 81 pounds uh, towards the end of her life. And and uh, she used to be taller, but just, you know, shrunk as happens and then got really, really skin and bones thin. And uh, she she had fallen and, and fractured her wrist, uh, just tripped over something. And there was, she was able to, to, to pull on this, this string that would uh, get somebody to come up to the room and came up to the room, and, and they're laying on the floor, the gal in the, in the home laying on the floor with her, waiting for the uh, ambulance to arrive, take her over to the hospital. And she's um, she wants to make sure, does her hair look okay? Does her hair look good? And uh, I've taken her to the hospital a few months back. She wasn't feeling well, so took her over there, uh, went to the emergency room, and she's just in her robe, you know, her nightgown and her robe, and and so she's not in her slippers, but I, I, she flips down the mirror in the car. We're going, it's nighttime. She flips down the mirror and she just wants to make sure her hair looks okay. And uh, they got a kick out of it. After when she fractured her wrist, didn't have full mobility, just moving around. We were able to, to, to get her to, to use an iPad because she didn't know what internet was or anything like that, or connecting or how to get stuff. And, and uh, but she her mind was sharp so we taught her how to use the ipad 
and they'd come in, the healthcare givers would come in, and they'd always say, yeah, she's so cute on that iPad. Apparently, she was the only 94-year-old in the home that was there playing solitaire and, and playing crossword puzzles and playing hangman and these other games, and she could just play them by the hour. Uh, but, you know, when I think back, I uh, think back to memories you, you you try to jar yourself. Think back. What about here? What about there? What about this? What about that? Well, my mom and dad were as, as happily married as any couple that I knew. I mean, wonderfully happily married a little over 30 years before my dad left this world in 1977. And, uh, you know, my mom would say every every night she would uh, she'd say goodnight to my dad, you know, right until her, you know, when I talked to her, you know, months back, she, every night she'd still say goodnight to him and would, would talk to God but never never heard his voice back. N- nice to know I, I have a, a deep confidence that she's with the Lord now. That as Jesus said, he who receives you receives me. And my mom did pray years ago. I asked her to pray a prayer. She did with me. But I, but I feel it was more through her son, if you know what I mean, that that she so knew what I believe was true and real and that she received me as a believer. And I believe that's sometimes how, especially with a Jewish family, uh, that, that someone will come to faith by receiving the child who is a believer and thereby receiving the Lord. And that's how their hearts become open. But uh, no more suffering, no more old age, no more loss of short-term memory and death in one ear and so frail you can't even get out of bed. Hard to imagine, hard to imagine the glories of the world to come. But be sure, be sure to live in such a way that if you have loved ones who know the Lord, that you're going to be with them forever. And then you'll look back, you'll look back at the years that you lived for God and you'll say, that was a life well spent so I honor my mom today, September 25th, 1922, to November 18th, 2016. Be sure to hug a loved one today. That's my bottom line.